warm welcome to folks uh, listening from wherever you are, and especially from Songas in Madison, England, Switzerland, and Alpine, Texas, and our dear friends in Hawaii and Chicago. And I'll give announcements um, at the beginning because uh, you usually don't have time at the end. So uh, Apomata will remain closed for the time being, at least the physical facilities. Um, this is to assure the safety of the Sangha, and we hope you'll be patient as we attempt to learn how to allow folks to return safely. Our May intensive has been moved up to June 22nd to the 28th. We'll get more information out soon about that. It's an integrated intensive. Uh, and it will uh, end with a one day sitting on the, that Sunday, the 28th. And we'll continue our practice period for the time being. So please pay attention to the four Brahma Viharas, both as you are receiving them and as you are radiating them. And as a reminder, our theme for the practice period is the Brahma Viharas or the four immeasurables of benevolence, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. So Joan has graciously agreed to continue in her role as head student through June. So please take advantage of teas with her. Uh, reminder, Tuesday Flint will again offer inquiry on Zoom. The link is in the calendar. <clears throat> and Saturday morning, there's a meditation and discussion of women in Zen at 8, followed by the Buddhist Action Now meeting, which moved to 2 p.m. So that's what's happening on Saturdays. So there are lots of other events on the calendar, so uh, check them and check them for the Zoom links for them are in the descriptions. <clears throat> so today what I wanted to talk about is uh, the pandemic versus the paramitas. Uh, so first of all, you know, we have to stop and take stock. How's your pandemic going so far? This has halftime reflections, right? Um, and you, we can reflect about how we have been using this time. Um, how have we been reorienting ourselves to the different time structures we're in now? And what are your aspirations for going forward? So this is a good time to think about that. <clears throat> because in a way we have a kind of special time out of time, which is an unexpected uh, opportunity, but also kind of shocking to our systems, and we've sort of been struggling to comprehend it, I think. But now we need to use it wisely uh, to continue our spiritual work on the path and to reconnect with our vow. So I wanted to look again at the paramitas as possibility in this time. I want to do a little series of talks about the paramitas. Um, and uh, this possibility is the possibility for observation without judgment. Um, and as you go through the week, uh, you can practice with these uh, particular paramitas. And these practices, practices represent intention versus drift or impulse. So we set an intention to practice and we use our wisdom to connect our thoughts, speech, and action to our vow and to ourself and to others. So these practices are a way of aligning our actions with our intention. But first, we of course have to work with our resistance. And I think of our resisting resistance as our conditioning versus our aspirations. So that's why we experience it as a kind of a struggle. Um, we have these hindrances that we're well aware of. Um, the first one of which is sense desires. So maybe I just need a little snack first. Um, and the second one is anger or ill will, which is easily surfaced under stress. So some of you may have noticed an increase in your irritation or annoyance or anger. Uh, the third one is sloth and torpor, which is the, ugh, do I have to? kind of dullness or apathy or depression that might arise. Uh, the fourth hindrance is restlessness and worry, and that's where we have this agitation and fear and dread and um, uh, the uncertainty bringing up our, uh, our, our agitation. So the fourth one, or the fifth one, is doubt, which can be either problematic or beneficial. It's problematic when it's disabling and paralyzing, 
Um, it's beneficial when it's a doorway to curiosity or a spur to investigation. So when you're saying to yourself, I'm not so sure I believe that, or I'm not so sure that rings true for me, um, you can either use it to stop your activity or disable you in certain ways, or as a doorway to curiosity. I wonder about that. So I would add to the hindrances fear. Um, and that fear for yourself, for others, is kind of the flip side of care. When we care for someone, we automatically, it automatically evokes some fear that they might encounter some difficulty or some pain or suffering. So when we encounter hindrances, surrender is the low road. We give in to those hindrances and they uh, slow us or present obstacles on our path. But the response that's uh, a wholesome response is not suppression, but investigation. When we have hindrances, we should investigate them. Um, and we recognize that spiritual power is building strength through opposition or testing. Um, so how are we doing so far in terms of how we uh, either give in to the hindrances or we build strength through meeting them? So we make resistance the subject. It's the subject of our friendly curiosity and our observation and our engagement and meeting and our clear understanding and affirming our commitment to our vow to ourself and to the world. So this is the subject of our attention then. Uh, so you have to be kind of bullheaded in spiritual practice. You have to refuse to be deterred from your aspiration. You have to use the same stubbornness that creates the resistance to refuse to surrender to it. So this means fierceness in the teeth of despair, but, you know, maybe we don't have that much fierceness at the moment. Even 5% sincerity is enough, as Suzuki Roshi said. If we have just, if we can marshal just a little bit of fierceness in the service of our vow, um, we can begin to practice with all of the things that seem to be obstructing it. So I want to talk particularly today about the first paramita, which is generosity or dana. Um, and traditionally, um, the material forms of that generosity were food, clothes, medicine, or shelter. These are all things that could be given that had a kind of material component. But there's also the spiritual generosity, which is traditionally offering the teachings that liberate people from suffering. And that was the Buddha's offering. So this paramita of generosity um, faces the pandemic. So it's generosity versus the pandemic. We see um, what happened. Uh, immediately, we saw a lot of hoarding, right? Flour, yeast, toilet paper. Uh, King Arthur Flour Company reported a 600% increase in their sales in March. Now they have 400 employee owners, so they, they had to gather everybody and say, what, what is going on and what are we gonna do about it, right? Uh, because there was um, this immediate perception of lack. Even though they were selling a half a million bags of flour per week, people still perceived there was no flour anywhere. So you can see the mind of grasping and also the mind of judging and blaming immediately arises. Uh, there's a kind of contagion, which is a form of panic. It's very infectious, um, this sense of lack and scarcity. And um, the mind of scarcity and predictions of scarcity really trigger our conditioning as a culture because we, are, we have been conditioned through advertising, through things like the self-help movement, through fear-mongering, through war, through exploitation of people and of nature and of the inherent uncertainty of things uh, to feel this lack and grasping. Uh, so uh, this creates the causes and conditions, this sense of lack and this fear create the causes and conditions for environmental destruction, for cruelty, for the collapse of morality, for hatred, ignorance, and people being ba basically lost in the self-centered dream. It makes people easily manipulated, easily controlled, 
and they easily come to accept the unacceptable. Violence, immorality, oppression, surveillance, inequality, um, false trade-offs, um, and extreme beliefs. So um, we take self-care to ridiculous extremes when we're caught in that self-centered dream. And self-protection and self-soothing and all of the ways in which we meet this unsettling circumstance in unhealthy and unwholesome ways. So how do we practice with all this? Uh, the acronym I was thinking of this morning was RAPID. First of all, we have to be quick. We have to recognize the signals when there's still just a warning light on the dashboard before the engine gets racing and breaks down. So we need to immediately notice the contraction and the agitation created by the hindrances and the sense of lack. We can see this in bodily sensations, um, accompanying emotion thoughts, and the patterns of those things. So first is recognizing the signals. Second is acknowledge what's happening. So we do this every morning when we say all my ancient twisted karma from beginningless greed, hate, and delusion born through body, speech, and mind. I now fully avow. We're acknowledging what's happening. And then the third part is pause. Pause before grasping. Pause before acting. Pause before speaking. Just long enough to investigate with some friendly curiosity. So um, in The World Could Be Otherwise, Norman Fisher says, we have to become diligent students of our own minds, messy and unpleasant as they are. <clears throat> we study our minds by noticing in detail whenever we feel pinched, small, fearful, or stingy, whenever we find ourselves seeing the glass half empty rather than half full, or clenching up with defensive and protective feelings. You know this one? We learn to identify these feelings in our bodies and minds, noticing the tightness in our chests and breathing and the clenching in our shoulders and faces, the old familiar paranoid and panicky trains of thought. With lots of patient repetition and training, eventually we will learn how to notice these things before they run away with us. We learn to catch ourselves in midstream and just literally stop. If we're walking, we stop walking. If we're sitting, we stand up. We take a conscious breath or two and ask ourselves, is this really true? Am I really under attack? Is there really not enough to go around? So then the D in uh, rapid is dispassion. Find a place of equanimity to gaze on the situation from. Access wisdom and compassion for yourself and for others and act from that place. We have this um, and this is uh, uh, our birthright. So generosity is not an abstract virtue, something good we should do. Um, it's a moment to moment expression in concrete reality in which we are open and relaxed and confident and courageous, allowing what's natural, this vast heart and mind uh, that the Buddha demonstrated for us, which <clears throat> Dogen called the three minds. This is in, the, uh, in, Bogen, in Dogen's Gen Genzo, uh, Tenzo Gyokan. Um, so these three minds are this mind, so Diane Rosetto writes about these in Deep Hope, which is a wonderful book on the Paramitas. Magnanimous mind. As for what is called magnanimous mind, Dogen said, this mind is like the great mountains or like the great ocean. It's not biased or contentious mind. Carrying half a pound, do not take it lightly. Lifting 40 pounds should not seem heavy. Although drawn by the voices of spring, do not wander over spring meadows, viewing the fall colors. Do not allow your heart to fail. The four seasons cooperate in a single scene. Regard light and heavy with a single eye. On this single occasion, you must write the word great. 
You must know the word great. You must learn the word great. The second mind is parental mind, which is natural care for what's cherished, appreciated, and beloved. It's effortless care, not burdened or self-sacrificing, because the other is not other. Our circle of care has widened to include more and more of life. And the third quality of mind is joyful mind. And what could be more joyful than to be able to provide what's needed? We give not from lack, but from feelings of abundance. Rosetto says, freedom from the boundaries of self brings true joy. When we practice the paramita of giving and receiving, by giving, relinquishing, we create joyful mind for ourselves. So this is what we have been studying in the Brahma Viharas, these qualities of kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And when we bring these qualities to generosity, we can see that they inform it and that generosity infuses each of these qualities. So <clears throat> we have to work with what is. Um, you know, I always say my t-shirt is going to be, I can't fix this. But I can respond, and I can respond in an open-hearted way. So generosity in action is the antidote to fear. Norman Fisher says every gift extends the heart and opens the spirit. And I think that's how we overcome fear and dread. When we are living with uncertainty and we don't know what comes next, and we don't know whether uh, our current state of things can even continue. So we turn towards helping others. And one of the ways we help others is by receiving. This gives others the experience of generosity, which is itself heart opening. And we help others by encouragement when they despair, even when they're doing well. And by this quality of fearlessness, Norman Fisher says the third traditional gift was fearlessness. You give it by giving love because when you feel loved, to give the gift of fearlessness is to give others the sense that they matter, that they're respected, cared for, secure within a loving reality, and therefore ultimately protected. You can't fake this. To be capable of giving fearlessness to others, you must have genuine confidence that there really is nothing to fear because love actually is built into the order of reality. It's not just a good idea. You feel it in your bones. It comes forth in you from your practice. Knowing that reality is inherently generous and loving certainly doesn't mean bad things can't happen. But when you are fearless, bad things can be okay. You can accept them. Shame, loss, physical pain, and even death are part of life. They're folded into the Bodhisattva's imaginative vision of the path ahead. Bodhisattva fearlessness doesn't deny catastrophe. It recognizes its inevitability. Everything that exists will one day not exist. This is how existence works. This is its beauty and the source of its bounty. So Bodhisattva fearlessness is very solid, very tough, very large, when you feel it, it's easy to give the gift of fearlessness. You will give it all the time. <clears throat> so we give uh, help with, to others by support, material if possible, by listening, by friendly interest and curiosity, and by being without judgment or criticism or unasked for advice and by inquiry, by engaging others in curiosity. And also by example, not showing off, but just simply by the example of your lived experience. So when we talk about the paramitas, we sometimes talk about cultivating the paramitas and cultivation is not striving. As Norman Fisher says, the effort to measure and accumulate progress is already small-minded and stingy. It already assumes you don't have enough, you are enough, and that you need more. 
So cultivation is more like cultivating a garden versus trying to make a tomato ripen. It's establishing the causes and conditions for natural mind, for genuine functioning in alignment with your intention and how to respond to what is. Because we're always choosing fear versus equanimity, contraction versus openness, active effort versus letting go, but each of these has its place. So wisdom is essential in discerning what's needed and how to respond to what is. So it returns us to our questions. What is in service to my vow? What is my deepest aspiration? These are the questions. And so I wanted to give folks a little bit of an opportunity to talk together in small groups about this um, paramita of generosity to brainstorm some generosity possibilities for yourself in your own life in the coming week. So concrete, actual thoughts about what can be done in the field of generosity. And it might be something so simple as just listening to someone. It might be something so simple as dropping a note to someone you haven't spoken with in a long time. So I'm going to um, suggest uh, that we um, break out into the groups of, let's see, we have 22 people. Uh, let's say groups of four, I think would be good. Or maybe groups of three, and then we'll have probably um, one group of two. Yeah. Yes. How do you let go? It's kind of good to talk with a small group, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Since we can't be all in the same room, at least we can be, you know, in this connected way, in a smaller, a little bit smaller, more intimate setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anything anyone um, wanted to share out of that? I'll raise my hand. Uh, I was in a group with Darcy and Kim, and of course, you know, Kim always brings up new things, at least he did for me. And he said the first person he was going to be generous to was himself, which, of course, we all applauded. But uh, it's, it's a really important statement. And uh, Darcy and I talked about how we might be much better people if we were better with ourselves. Yeah, that capacity to be generous with yourself is what affords generosity for others, you know. <clears throat> you recognize the ways we've been withholding or um, criticizing or judging or blaming ourselves. Um, it's not very generous. Yeah, that's... That's a really important suggestion. Okay. Barbara? Yeah, actually more of a question. Uh, is, the <clears throat> Gisho rocks, uh, is that how you say it? The, pardon me? The Gisho rocks that we were going to paint in May, did that? Gisho. 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 What is Gizo. it? Gizo. J-I-Z-O. Jizo. Um, is that going to happen? <laughs> yes. It's already happened. <laughs> yeah, Sabrina's got to reschedule it. It's an in-person thing. <clears throat> it could be a non-in-person thing. <laughs> she, she didn't want to do it not in person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was her choice. Okay. Yeah. We'll reschedule it. It's going to happen. Yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> well, one of the things that came up in our group was the complexity of of generosity, especially in these times and knowing how to most skillfully deal with the situations that we're being presented with, with people's varying opinions about what's responsible and what's wise and just out there in the public in general. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's very, it, it requires a new set of skills, right? A new 
um, kind of um, re-envisioning and re-imagining of what generosity looks like under these circumstances. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and it's so varied. I mean, people have such creative ways of expressing their generosity. And on the walk we take in the morning, we walk past the poem of the day. So there's, uh, you know, uh, there it is. Someone is offering a poem every day out in front of his house. So, so there are all these different expressions of that. And sometimes I think what we have is more a failure of imagination than a, a failure of generosity. Like we just don't envision what might be possible. It might be something quite simple. It might be a willingness to listen without any agenda. Um, that's a very generous act. It might be reaching out to someone we haven't heard from in a long time in some way. Um, so yes, we have social distancing out in the world and we have uh, uh, the ways in which we are constrained that are different from the ways we used to be constrained. So we used to be constrained by, I'm so busy, right? Um, and now we have a different construct of time. Maybe we can stop thinking, I'm so busy, uh, about the things that we really, uh, that we really want to be doing. So there's uh, kind of, uh, in a way, there's kind of a generosity built into the situation in that we, it gives us an opportunity to be much more reflective about our intentions and how they get realized, how we express them, and gives us a chance to be more creative. <clears throat> our practice, as you know, Norman Fisher wisely pointed out, is an act of imagination. And we won't get a better world until we can imagine it. We have to bring it into being through our imagination. Well, for me, um, I want to share in your group, one thing for me was very interesting to discover that even though I was doing the connection with my close friends and my family, I really wasn't doing too much connection with my neighbor, my neighbor. Ah. You know? uh -huh. Everybody is on shelter in shelter or some people working so you don't see you see some of them but i don't see when i out uh -huh. and the thing is uh, that this talk really uh, brought me that how can i do some connection besides just say hello or good morning even though a little post notes and condors like little words uh -huh. of orange i don't know what we do but what yeah. you're saying yes is bring this creativity to do something. Yeah. yeah, this is what we can this is what we can do and we can do it individually, we can do it collectively. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have the little breakout rooms or share some ideas and think about what that would look like. Um, over the coming week, just be alert to opportunities mm -hmm. and possibilities. Um, there's something so mind expanding and heart opening about that quality for both the giver and the receiver. <clears throat> That's a miracle to me that people aren't doing it more all the time. You know, like that there's, um, that there's any grasping at all makes no sense, really. Uh, so, yeah, so let's try and be intentional about that. Uh, just that brainstorming, being creative, thinking about it, maybe next week we can share a little bit of what we discovered over a week of playing with this idea. What does that mean? And where we feel, start to feel a little like a little contraction, you know, or a little pulling back or a little withholding. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but just to notice that, oh, that makes, that shrinks me, it makes me smaller. It's a painful kind of contraction. Um, and what are the alternatives to contracting in that way? Oftentimes it's just fear-based. It's just uncertainty and fear that uh, motivates that. Uh, fear of lack. You know, people don't have lack, they have fear of future lack. And so this is why, you know, there are people with 50 pounds of flour in their pantry and they don't even really bake, you know. <laughs> so, you can see it's, just, it's, it's fear of future lack even because things are uncertain. And this is what is uh, animating people a lot. So 
Yeah, so now as far as I can tell, there's like billions and billions and billions of cloth masks everywhere because people had the perception that there would be a lack, right? <laughs> so, and that, and that gets fostered. I mean, um, and certainly the, the, um, the media and the interwebs are perfect at expounding on the idea of lack because it's such a mercantile environment, right? So constantly trying to um, convince people they have a lack, which you fortunately can satisfy with your whatever. Um, so, uh, so I think it's interesting to watch too, not in this particular paramita, not only um, look for ways that we uh, can offer some generosity, but also look for the ways that we're being manipulated into believing that things are or that there's not enough of something or that we are, are lacking in some way. The whole self-help movement is built on that, for example. So, um, <clears throat> so you can ask yourself, what's really missing right now? And people uh, deal with uncertainty by trying to project a future lack when we don't even know exactly what we would be lacking. You know, we don't have any idea what could be lacking in some uncertain future. So we just blindly, you know, strike out and, you know, buy five pounds of yeast or whatever, uh, because we, we're, we, it's anticipatory, right? We're trying to anticipate what we might lack, but we have no idea. You know, we may store up a whole bunch of supplies in our house, and that's not the thing that actually it turns out we're lacking. So, so I think um, this flip side of generosity is to recognize the ways in which our minds are being, uh, um, you know, infected, really infected with what is the contagion of lack. So of course you're going to take care of, you know, normal provisions. And, and, and it's not unreasonable to have a supply of provisions in case the power goes out, in case something happens. But I'm talking about the kind of panic and anxiety that gets produced and generated and propagated by rumor. So nothing more concrete than that. And it's very unwholesome for our state of mind and our sense of well-being, but even more important, it's very unwholesome for our relationships with others. We start to feel competitive. We start to feel, uh, you know, self-centered and I've got to take care of me and we get into survival mode and all of that um, wreaks havoc on our relationships. Anne. Um, what you're just in saying that, it made me think about the um, perceived or possible lack of ICU beds and ventilators. Yeah. How that that is a at a very core level, one of the biggest fears driving our response and conflict and so much around what's been going on. Right. And as it turns out, you may not be dealing with COVID, you may be dealing with a flood. Like, in uh, yeah. all the people in New Orleans, when the hurricane hit, their provisions <laughs> like everything else, you know? <laughs> so... Uh, so we have this grasping mind, which is trying to protect us from some uh, bleak or catastrophic future that we don't, we can't even recognize because we don't know what it's going to be. So the gift of fearlessness that we can give others, we have to first give ourselves. And that's our challenge in practice. So... But practice is itself grounding in fearlessness. And hey, can I ask you? Yeah, a Darcy. Question. Um, so, could you just review the acronym RAPID that was uh, oh, sure. uh, you were describing the qualities of the response? Uh, yeah, so, with the acronym RAPID. Yeah. So first is. Um, uh, is the R is, um, hold on here, let me get to that point. Um, okay, uh, recognize the signals. Recognize. So, okay. Some contraction, some, it's usually something in the body, but you know, it's a warning light on the dashboard, as I said, some contraction or agitation, uh, which we experience as bodily sensations and accompany 
emotion thoughts. Sometimes we tune in to the emotion thoughts before we even realize we've had a bodily sensation, for example. Um, and no noticing some patterns there. There'll be some patterns in the thought system. Uh, the second one, A, acknowledge what's happening. This is the all my ancient twisted karma part, right? Um, uh, oh, I'm getting ramped up. Oh, I'm getting a sense of scarcity, right? Um, and then P, pause before grasping. Uh, once you've acknowledged what's happening. And then uh, uh, four is investigate with friendly curiosity. How is it really? Uh, and then uh, five is dispassion. Find a place of equanimity to gaze on the situation and access wisdom and compassion for yourself and for others and act from that place. Does that make sense? Yes. And I like I like this acronym because uh, because of Joko saying to me, there's no difference between you and me, only I'm a little quicker. <laughs> so yeah. it's about um, it's about how rapid can you recognize the, the signals, acknowledge what's happening, pause, investigate, and move to dispassion. Thank you. Dispassion was the one I, I could not uh, remember what the D was. OK. Yeah. Sometimes that. that takes some imagination to come up with that place of where, where you can find that place of equanimity. Yeah, or equipoise. It's, um, so I like equipoise because it's not a stable fixed state. It's, this, it's like being on a bicycle or on a surfboard where you're finding your balance. Um, and this passion, because it could be aversion, it could be longing and clinging, you know, it could even be zoning out that are um, the problematic issues. So um, this passion is relinquishing those, you know, so that you're free. I mean, it's not about being a stoic, it's about relinquishing the things that are making you not free. The grasping, the aversion and the ignorance are making you not free. So we're not, we don't beat ourselves up about it. We don't engage the critic on it. Um, this passion is stepping away from all that, that, that entanglement of the conditioning. And the impulsivity and reactivity. So then we can gaze on the situation from the place of wisdom and compassion and act from that place. Which we don't have access to otherwise, right? Uh, when we're in our spin. <clears throat> so, yeah, so see if that acronym uh, works for you. Try it out, you know. It can happen like that in the blink of an eye. It can happen over a period of days where you're like sorting things out <clears throat> in order to get to uh, some understanding of what's going on. So there's no real time frame, but I like the idea that um, it's rapid because it quickly gets us uh, disentangled from the conditioning that's uh, that's ensnaring us. Yeah, so it gets to the point. I mean, I, I always feel like in the beginning, it, all your conditioning is like you're tangled up in a barbed wire fence that's all tangled, right? This big knot of barbed wire. And if you practice long enough, you'll get to the point where it's not that there's no barbed wire, but it's like a little piece that's caught your sleeve and you just lift it off, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a different experience. So hopefully practice uh, will help you um, get free of the entanglement of conditioning, which is painful. Yeah. Anything else? It seems like this process, it seems like the process is facilitated by the slowness of the days that yeah. we have now to be able to give it time to go through this process because like for me I'm not that rapid yet yeah <laughs> so it's yeah. helpful to have yeah. that. and if you want to read the um, two recent books about the paramitas one is by Norman Fisher the world could be otherwise and Great. the other one is by Diane Rosetto who did our precepts book waking up to what you do and this is called deep hope Um, and I, you know, I like her voice, so it's a man and a woman, 
Um, Zen guidance for staying steadfast when the world seems hopeless. So I can, I highly recommend them. Um, I really appreciate Norman Fisher invoking imagination as the heart of the Bodhisattva path, to be able to imagine the relief of suffering, to imagine the awakening of beings. I think this is a, this is a creative act. Okay. Any last thoughts before we do service? Yes, no. Okay, so Anne's going to mute you and I'm going to get things set up here. <laughs>